Well, good morning, everyone. We welcome you to the Lower Derby United Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Darrell Tozer, and it's a delight to have you listening to us today. Some of you are hearing this message. You're listening to Life Radio in the city of Miramichi, New Brunswick. Others of you are finding us on YouTube, and we are glad that you are listening. We are doing a series in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. It's called Learning to Walk. And this morning, our subtitle would be that we are saved to serve. I want to remind everyone that uh, when you were born, a few months after you were born, you learned to walk physically. If you have been born again, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, it's important then as a Christian to learn to walk to please the Lord. As a matter of fact, it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, He who abides in him, that is Jesus, ought himself also so to walk, just as he walked. And we know that in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. We know from St. Paul's writings that it says in Colossians 1 verse 10 that we should walk worthy of the Lord unto all well-pleasing. So we are interested in trying to find out how we're supposed to walk or conduct ourselves as Christians. Psalmist said, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. With that said, let's pause for a moment of prayer. Father, open up our hearts to your word today. Speak to us that we might understand what you caused to be written by inspiration so many years ago. And Lord, for all who are listening today, who have made a profession of faith and who have trusted Jesus as their Savior, may we grow in our walk with you as a result of absorbing your precious word. We ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as we began Ephesians chapter 4 last week, we talked about we as Christians are to walk worthy of the Lord. Uh, I won't uh, take a lot of time to review all of that again, but the word to walk worthy is an interesting old Greek word, and it has to do with scales. Remember that? It has to do with, you know, if you remember the old days when you went into a place and they, uh, the, the scales had uh, balance, and they put the, the weight on one side, and they start pouring the, the sugar or the flour on the other side, and when it got to balance, you say, okay, you, you, have, you have the pound. Uh, walking worthy of the Lord means this, that since the Lord has saved us and we have all these wonderful things of knowing Jesus Christ and all of these wonderful blessings, then we should live in a, in a way that corresponds to all of the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to walk worthy of the Lord. And the first thing we learned about walking worthy was that we are to walk humbly. Uh, we are to walk in, in, in lowliness. We are to walk with, with gentleness and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and then it talked about all of the things that we as God's people need to believe that are beliefs in common. And again, I'm not going to go through that, but it starts at verse 4. Uh, one body, one faith, we call it one hope, we're calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and, and so on. Now when it gets down here to verse number 7, it talks about us individually. Uh, all of us are individuals, even though we're one in Christ, we're all members of the body of Christ. If we have trusted him as our personal savior, we're not all the same. We're not carbon copies of each other, even though we are brothers and sisters with each other in Christ. It says here, but each one of us to each one of us was grace given. What's that talking about? Well, it's talking about that God has gifted every person who knows Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Uh, you have a spiritual gift. Now, I know on your birthday, or at least on my birthday when I was growing up, Mom always had birthday gifts for my sister and myself. And, and of course, as you know, I have an adopted brother. Uh, but when you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God also gave you a gift. Uh, I hope you have opened the gift. As a matter of fact, I hope you're using the gift. Have you ever given somebody a gift, uh, maybe perhaps something to wear, and you never see them wearing it? You kind of wonder if they like the gift, don't you? It's kind of an insult that they don't use the gift. Well, uh, when we trusted Christ as our Savior, the Lord gave us a gift. Have you opened the gift? Do you know what the gift is? And are you using the gift? It says, uh, but to each one of us, grace was given according uh, to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace was given. That means God gave us an ability with which we are to serve him. Now, you know, there's all kinds of grace in the Bible. 
Uh, right? Grace is, is, is unmerited favor, isn't it? There's all kinds of grace in the Bible. There's saving grace. And then there's sustaining grace. When we have all these trials, right? My grace is sufficient for thee. This is enabling grace. God wants all of us to serve using the ability and the gift that he has given us. He has empowered us to serve. Let me say this, uh, some things about these gifts. You know, we all have natural gifts and abilities, don't we? Some of us are born with an aptitude and perhaps to teach or an aptitude to do other things. But when you were born again, when you trusted Christ as Savior, you were also giving a, a gift beyond that of your natural gift. Now, God can use us when we use our natural gifts. And God wants to use us with the, wants us to use the gift that he has given us when we were saved. Can I say this? No gift should be sought. You say, oh boy, I'd like to have that gift. No gift should be sought. No, no gifts need to be asked for. You say, how do you know that? Well, you just read it in the Bible. It's 1 Corinthians uh, 12, verse number 11, and it makes it very, very clear. Matter of fact, I think I have it right close in my Bible. Let me read it to you. It says, but one and the same spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. The Holy Spirit gives each one a gift as he sees that we need that gift. So it's important to understand that all gifts should be, uh, should be used. No gifts should be unused. There's no gifts that are not important. Like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the hand cannot say uh, to the eye, I don't need you. Uh, and, and the eye cannot say to another part of the body, well, I don't need you. All parts of our physical bodies are needed. And all gifts that God has given to those that are saved are needed. No gift should be exalted. Nobody should go around and say, hey, I got the gift to speak. <laughs> I'm better than you. No, 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 no. No gift should be exalted. The Bible says not to, to puff ourselves up in, in that fashion. Grace is given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Some people have been given the gift to teach. Uh, maybe they can't teach as well as others because they just have a certain measure of the gift of teaching. That's what it means, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So when you were saved, God gave you a gift. Now I want you to know, oh, by the way, can I just pause for a minute? Do you know what your gift is? Because it's a real, it's a real shame to live all of your life as a Christian and not know what your spiritual gift is. Now I'm going to tell you about the cop-out. There's a lot of people like to cop out and they like to say, oh yeah, my gift is just the gift of helps. In other words, I'm not interested in the gifts. Don't ask me to do anything. I'm not interested in discovering my gift. I just have the gift of helps. There is such a thing as the gift of helps. But generally when people say that, they're just copying out. Because uh, we need to discover truly what the ability that God has given us to serve. And now I know the next verse. Therefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That's a quote from the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, chapter 68. Uh, it's interesting. It's talking about um, an ancient custom they used to have. When, uh, when ancient kings would go to war and they would win the war, after they won the war, they would come home and they would have a big parade through town or through the village. And uh, in that parade, they would, they would uh, show off the prisoners that they caught from the other side. They would, uh, they would hand out gifts to people of spoils they got in the country where they, uh, where they had uh, won the war. And, and they would just hand out gifts to everybody. And it was, it was a pretty exciting time. That is used as an illustration of what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus was sent down from, from heaven by God the Father. He came down here and he fought a battle. And I'll tell you something, and he won. Jesus Christ, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came into the world to die on a cross. He went there and took the punishment of our sin. He shed his blood. He was buried and he rose again and he ascended up to heaven. He came down here to the lower parts down to earth, left the glory of heaven, was laid in straw in Bethlehem's manger, and, 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 and then went to the cross, rose again, and ascended up to heaven. And when he ascended up to heaven, all those who trust Jesus Christ as Savior then are given gifts. He won the battle. He paid for our sin. He rose from the dead. When he ascended to heaven, he gives us gifts. Oh, I don't know. Um, you know that Christ came down to the depths of humility. 
Um, sometimes when I, I speak at Christmas time, I, I, I like to title my message, I wouldn't have done it that way. You know, if, if, if I was God and I was sending my son into the world, there'd be a little bit of fanfare. I don't know, but uh, I, I'd do something like they do over in England when they, when, uh, you know, when they crowned uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, I kind of got fascinated with that gold chariot. I don't know why they don't put the name Corolla on the front of the chariot, but anyway, nonetheless, it, it's, you know, we, we, we think of pomp and pageantry, don't we? But when Jesus came down here, he came down into humility and he died in our place. He who was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. And when it was all over, uh, 40 days after the resurrection of Christ, he ascended up to heaven. And, and then all those who trust Jesus Christ as Savior are given gifts as a result of the victory that he won on the cross. You say, Pastor Tozer, what are the gifts? They're mentioned in three places in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think they're going to be on the screen behind me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4 gives a list of four of the gifts. Now, there's four gifts in Ephesians uh, chapter 4. I call these uh, four gifted men are mentioned. And the first one is uh, apostles. You know there were 12 apostles. Do you know what apostle means? It just means one cent. We don't have pennies anymore in our uh, monetary system, do we? But I uh, often was speaking to kids. I would get out a penny and hold it up. An apostle was one cent. One cent by Christ at the beginning of the church age to do teaching to lay the foundation of the church. And in addition to apostles, there were prophets. Now, prophets didn't just foretell the future. We think of a prophet as someone who foretells the future. You know, what's going to happen five years from now? Prophets not only foretold the future, but they foretold the truth of God. Now, just imagine. I don't know how, how well you love your Bible. But imagine if you had to give up all your Bibles. And if it was going to be that, that you would no longer have a Bible. If, if you didn't have a Bible, how would you learn about God? Well, I know the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show of his handiwork, right? You can walk out at night and look up there and you can say, boy, some wonderful, powerful, almighty creator made all this. There wasn't just a boom, boom and a bang, bang. And all of a sudden, all these millions of stars appear. Uh, God did it. But, but, but to know God personally, we need a Bible. Do you know that in the first century, there was no Bible? No Bible. You say they didn't have King James? No, they didn't. There was no Bible. So God revealed his truth to men that were called prophets. And the prophets then declared to the people what God had told to them. So at the beginning of the church age, laying the foundational teaching and doctrine for the church, there were apostles and there were prophets. You say they laid the foundation for the teaching of the church? Oh, it sure did. If you want to read about that, read in chapter 2 and verse number 20. And it tells you that. Having been built upon the, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So I remind you that uh, there are no uh, apostles today and there are no prophets today. Not in the same sense as there were apostles and prophets in the New Testament. There's no such a thing as apostolic uh, succession. Some people say, well, I'm an apostle. No, you're not. Because an apostle had to be someone who had seen the risen Christ with his own eyes. And the last apostle was St. Paul, who saw Christ on the Damascus road. Beyond that, he was the last apostle. So we're not apostles in the sense of New Testament apostles. But it is true that the Lord has sent us. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, didn't he? In John chapter 20, I believe it's verse number 21. So uh, we're not prophets in the sense that, that we tell new truth. If someone gets up to you and comes up and stands up in a meeting and says, I have a new revelation from the Lord. Don't believe it. If, if, if there's new revelations from the Lord, that means that this is not sufficient. I believe the word of God is complete and full and sufficient. There's no such a thing as someone getting a new message from the Lord. 
I'll never forget a number of years ago when it was, you know, when the, the year was turning over from the 1900s to 2000, there were people going around saying they had a message from the Lord and the world was going to do all this and disintegrate and all this stuff was going to happen. And, and it all came from the Lord. Well, it didn't happen. And, and what they said didn't come from the Lord either. It came from their idea, I think, to sell books and get attention. We have to understand that the Bible, uh, the 66 books of the Bible make up the complete Bible and it's complete. If God wants to speak to somebody, he does it by his spirit through his word. It's important, friends, to stick to that. So uh, we're not prophets in the sense that we get new revelation, but we are, are to forth tell, uh, spread abroad the truth that is found in the word of God. Then it says evangelist. You know, an evangelist is someone who bears good news. Uh, we sometimes think of an, uh, an evangelist as a guy that has 10 suits and 10 sermons. And he travels around from place to place and preaches the same sermon everywhere he goes. Well, evangelists in the New Testament were like missionaries. They would go into an area where Christ was not known. They would preach the gospel. People would be saved. They would, they would ground them in the truth. And then they would leave and go to another area where Christ was not known. And preach the gospel and get people saved and get them grounded in the truth and plant a church. That's what an evangelist would. Now, uh, there are evangelists today. There are many, many unreached areas of the world that need to hear the gospel of Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. We know that in the book of Acts, Philip was an evangelist. It's important to share the truth of the scriptures. Then it says pastors and teachers. This is interesting because I don't think these are two separate gifts here. The construction of the original Greek Bible, it, it, it means pastor-teachers. In other words, every pastor is a teacher, but not every teacher is a pastor. Can you get that? You see, there is the gift of teaching, but uh, not every person who has the gift of teaching is a pastor. But all uh, pastors are teachers. Uh this thing about being a pastor, there's uh, three different words in the Bible to describe the pastor. Um, the word pastor means uh, shepherd or someone who cares and looks after sheep. That's what pastor, that's what the word pastor means, is shepherd. Uh, it, it's an interesting word in the Bible. I think, is it up there? Yeah, the word poimain. Uh, that's the word for pastor. So the function of a pastor is to look after the sheep. In other words, to, to seek to look after and to feed those who know Christ as Savior. Then there's another word in the New Testament for a pastor. It's called episkopos. And that's, uh, we get the uh, denomination known as the Episcopalians. They, they have taken off on that word. And it, it refers to someone who is an overseer. Someone who, who, is, who is looking over generally and seeing how everything is and everything being in order. And then there's a third word and it's presbyteros. And some of you who know the denominations know that the Presbyterians have taken off on that word. Uh, that comes from the word uh, presbyteros. And presbyteros is, uh, is the main word that's used in the New Testament. It's there 70 times. And it refers to someone who is elderly or mature. Someone who is not a new or novice Christian, but a mature person who is stable and of good character and filled with the Holy Spirit and has wisdom and discernment. And, and is impartial and is courageous in their service for the Lord. That's what, so that, that's the whole function of what a pastor does. He, he, he's a shepherd, uh, very, very clearly he's a shepherd. More than being a shepherd, he, he's an overseer. And more than that, he is, uh, he is to be a person who is stable spiritually. Now, why did God give these gifts to certain people uh, for the church? Why? It tells you why right here in the next verse. It says, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints. That's, that's very clear. But by the way, uh, in my Bible, it says uh, for the, uh, the perfecting of the saints, if you have the old King James, the word perfecting, or if you have the new King James as I do for the uh, equipping of the saints, is an interesting word because it means to mend. Do you remember the story in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 4, of James and John, who were with their father in the ship, and it says they were mending their nets? Same word here, same word. Uh, this idea... Uh, God gave these gifts to people in the church for the mending of the saints. You say, what's that mean? It means this, that many of God's people lapse into a state of disrepair. And when they lap into a state of disrepair, they need to be sought after and restored and made useful and brought to maturity. And that's the job of these particular men 
who are gifted here that are that we just considered. It's for the, the mending of the church, for the equipping of the saints. Now there's something for the work of the ministry. <laughs> now notice that people are not only to be restored and brought back to the Lord, they're to be involved in the ministry for the work of the ministry. That means they're to become involved in the Lord's work. Every Christian is to be involved in the Lord's work. Uh, I don't want to, don't, don't get upset with me, okay? Don't get, get, get mad or sore at me. Uh, attendance is a, is a poor substitute for participation. Did you get that? You say you don't want me to attend. Oh, no, no, don't, don't go crazy. Sure, it's important that all of us attend, but attendance is a poor substitute for participation. Every one of us are supposed to use our gifts in the work of the Lord. And I find that if people are not involved and if they don't use their gifts in the work of the Lord, they become, they become critical and, and, and they, become, they become picky people. Uh, this is for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everybody knows what the word edifying means, what it means to be built up. And it's not talking about the building of a church uh, uh, physically. It's talking about the building up of people internally and spiritually in their walk with God. So all of us need to use our, our gifts. It says, till we all come in the unity of the, of the faith. In other words, so we all come to understand what, what real, true, biblical teaching and doctrine really, really is. And it says, and the knowledge of the Son of God. It's one thing to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. I hope you know Christ as your personal Savior. I, I, I talk about this all the time. I talk about when I was saved. All the time. You heard me mention probably a dozen times, right? I was saved in 1956 in July. On July the 8th, 1956, I came to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. But that's not what it's talking about here. You know what it's talking about here? It's talking about an intimate personal knowledge of Christ. It's talking about daily fellowship and a walk with God. Like Paul said, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's what it's talking about. Living a life of obedience and following the Lord so that we grow up to be a, a mature man and so that Christ is seen in our life. Did you see that here? It says, till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature or perfect person, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so people can see Jesus in us. Do you ever sing that song? Oh, it's an, oh, I know I'm dating myself. I can't help it. Mm -hmm. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, all I ask to be like him. That's, that's what the Lord wants us. He wants us to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I haven't got a lot of time left, but I want to get to verse 14. It says that we should no longer be children. God, God doesn't want us to... You say, what's that phrase? God doesn't want us to be children. God doesn't want us to be immature. Immature. You say, what are you, what are you really getting at? Uh, God wants... God wants his people to grow up in the faith and have stability. I wrote down in my notes, this refers to immaturity. You know, a child is so quick and they're so naive, aren't they? They're so, they lack discernment. They are easily conned. That's why if you have young children in your family, especially when they get out of the house and start to go to school, you better give them some street smarts. You say, what street smarts? Street smarts is, is getting them to understand the way it is in the world so they won't be sucked in by some con man and lured into their car and kidnapped or some terrible thing happened to them. That's why we say to little children, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to people you don't know. Because you don't know who is going to manipulate you. And we don't know who's going to snatch and take them. God doesn't want his people who know Jesus Christ as personal Savior to be immature. You say, what do you mean by being immature? They're so immature that every new religious novelty that comes along, they fall for it. Look at the text. No longer children toss to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Every little bit of new teaching that comes along, tossed to and fro, that's the imagery of a boat or a ship in the water, isn't it? You know when there's a big wind, what, 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 what that does, it's, <laughs> it, it just tosses the boat all around in the, in the storm. God doesn't want his people. He wants, them, he wants them established, and he wants stability in their lives. Uh, I'm not sure where I am for time here. It says, by the trickery of men. Uh, the trickery of men. <laughs> that's a real interesting word. It's in the Greek. It's it's K U B I A, and it, it's a word that has to do with 
from which we get the word cube, you know, cube, C-U-B-E, and, and it refers to the, the gamblers years ago who had dice, and the dice were loaded on one side. So when they tossed the dice, the heavy side of the dice always landed on the table so they could determine the outcome of something, right? So it's so very important. Let's understand this very, very clearly that um, God wants us to be mature people, not at, at the mercy of every religious hoister who comes along with some new idea or some new doctrine. I was watching a little while ago. I don't watch religious TV very much because I get upset. But I was watching religious TV not too long ago, and I'm not going to name the individual that was on there, but... Uh, he, he, this, this particular individual uh, had this idea. God has spoke to him. That, that, there's another, that, that bothered me again when he said that. Uh, God has spoke to him and told him that there was a cure for COVID-19. And, uh, and he had it in this bottle and he held up the bottle and it was for sale. And he had a doctor there with him at the, at the next table to where he was, uh, verifying that this was the cure for COVID. And of course, uh, send in your money. You don't, that's what it's always about, isn't it? Send in your money. And get this bottle and your COVID will be gone. Do, 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 do. Was that right? Now, by the way, the United States government charged that preacher. And I think he has yet to go to court. But you know what amazes me? Here's what amazes me. That that particular individual was getting so much money through the mail from Christian people. Who don't get it. They're, they're captured and enamored with the trickery of men who, who are deceiving them. Cunning craft. Well, how does it, how does it word it here? The trickery of men by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. You know, that, that's a fisherman's term. Any, anybody here a uh, fly fisherman? <laughs> you get that little fly? Oh, uh, okay. And... Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes you go feed and you put that worm on there. You, you're a rascal. You know what you're doing? You're disguising the hook. <laughs> you're deceiving the fish. He thinks, well, it's time for breakfast. Look at this. Isn't it just the providence that this juicy worm happens to be floating in my area? And he bites into it and you caught him. Friends, there are all kinds of novel interpretations of Scripture where people are trying to capture you, get your attention. They're crafty, and they're out to deceive you. Oh, and then I, I got to stop. There are religious Sharpies. Have you ever seen these religious Sharpies? These religious Sharpies, they, they go from door to door. Sometimes they, they go in church parks and set up their displays and try to talk to people. They're smooth talking. And if you are an immature Christian, they will deceive you. They will use some of the same words that are in the Bible that you were used, but they have a different meaning put to those words. And they want to capture you. God doesn't want you to be immature. He wants you to grow up and be stable in your life. Oh, friends, I, I have to close today, and I want to say this. It's so important. Friends, follow carefully the teaching of the Word of God and ignore those who have novel and strange ideas. Stick to the Scriptures. And if you do that, you will stick to the truth. Lord, bless thy word. Help us to grow in our lives so that we become mature, uh, stable Christians. That the world may see what a real, true child of God is. Help us to follow you that they might, they might see Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen.